All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you feel like you had a break. You may have noticed we have some, some people sitting on the stage. Uh, we're going to be talking next with, this is an entirely enterprise organization panel. We're going to be talking about the horizons of finance transformation. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce HFS's very own Sarab Gupta, President of Research and Advisory Services. Sarab. All right, all right. How was coffee? Good? Coffee was good? All right, all right. So look, we're gonna talk about, you know, Phil was talking about this digital dichotomy that there's this big slowdown and there is a big hurry and both of them are happening at the same time. And actually these four people are at the center of that, right? Because finance is at the center of helping organizations navigate that digital dichotomy. So I'm very glad to have all four of you and would love if you can introduce yourself. Maybe we, we'll start with you, Tim, very quickly. You know, yeah, what do you thanks. do, where you are? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, so I'm Tim Hammonds. Um, I'm responsible for finance shared services at Stellantis, uh, which is probably the largest car company most of you never heard of. Um, it was created a couple of years ago by the merger of Fiat Chrysler and, and PSA, which is the company behind the Peugeot, Citroën, Opel and Vauxhall brands. Okay. Uh, Joe Anichby, I run a small boutique uh, consultancy firm, 25, 30 years in the city, doing various roles, ITCFO, running shared services, running global finance systems projects group, and the last 10 years I've been uh, doing the consultancy uh, work. Hi, I'm Carolina Romero. I am the CFO for Global Private Banking and Wealth at HSBC. Prior to that, um, which is a new job, three weeks on the job, um, I was the COO for Global Finance, and before I was in Asia, um, being the CFO for Commercial Banking and Global Banking in our Asia operations. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael van der Steen. Uh, I work at the coolest company in the world, I think, which is Adidas. You can see my shoes. So. Um, I'm responsible for plan to invoice strategy and operational excellence within GBS. Uh, and plan to invoice is supply chain and customer service, so it's not necessarily finance. Uh, but I've spent over 25 years in order to cash, so I kind of know a little bit about finance as well. <laughs> look under your chairs there, like Michael is sponsoring sneakers for everyone. Look, look and you'll, you'll get them. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 was about to, I was about to say that you'll get a Maserati, but everybody knows that at HFS you won't get that, right? So I thought Adidas might be a little more believable. Well, if you download the app, you can actually put new virtual shoes on your feet, right? So I would recommend download the app, have a look, and buy some shoes. <laughs> You're not sponsoring, so? Huh? No, no even, sponsoring, even, no. Even here. Okay. No, no, we need the money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's start with with a poll, and I have to come here because I can't see very well. Um, you know, I've been doing finance research for donkey's years now, 25 plus years, but I'm more confused than ever today on what is the role of finance, right? And, and so I thought I'll ask this audience, uh, you know, what do you think is the role of finance? Is it bottom line impact by driving down costs? Is it, is it managing risks and compliance? Uh, is it actually driving outcomes, you know, working capital, DSO, DPO, all these, uh, funny looking acronyms. Is it actually making progress on ESG? Uh, is, it, is it improving company valuation overall and driving shareholder value? Or it's everything at the same time? So it's all of the above at the same time. That seems to be the consensus. So, so let me ask you, Carolina, is that, is that true? Is that the truth? Is that what, what you feel? Um, yeah, definitely. I think um, the role of the CFO in across different organizations, and particularly in financial services, has been quickly evolving over the last 10 to 15 years. I think the world, when I started my career, and sort of the things that you needed to learn and, and develop to, to become the CFO of a company have massively changed. Um, not only in terms of the actual skills, but actually how you approach the job and what is your relationship with other areas of, of the company um, and how closely you need to work, but in a completely different way. I think he has moved from a very strict reporting, compliance, regulatory requirement, um, capital and liquidity protection to actually strategic usage of our resources while at the same time being immersed in 
really the key decisions around new technologies, new ways of working, um, how to translate that into value, not just profit, but actually value for our stakeholders, um, and how to make all of that connected <laughs> to the different parts of the organization. I do think that we, that we play a lot more of a glue and connectivity role than before. Uh, while at the same time, that change um, is demanding from the finance leader or professionals to develop um, and get sort of familiar and, and much more up to speed to different skills that in the past were prob probably not necessary. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's what we are finding in our research. We, we reached out to about 400 Global 2000 enterprises and asked them what is the role of finance. And it came down to these four things that you can see here, cost, control, outcomes, but also influence. And influence, it means influencing business strategy, influencing business growth. What's interesting is that only 12% of them said that they're able to achieve all four, right? Uh, and so while I think the why is fairly clear, the how you get there uh, to be at uh, you know five on five on all four of those dimensions or all of the above is seemingly very, very hard. And I think I just wanted to ask you guys, right? Why, why is that? Maybe Joe, if I can ask you, why, why do we see only 12% finance superheroes? You know, why can't there be more? But I apologize, I've got a cough, so I'm stuck in a sweet, so it's not that I'm being rude. Um, I think if I look back when I started, I would say 95% of my role was in books and records, making sure that everything ticked and tied. And what I've found, especially in the consultancy work that I'm doing now, when you go out to different organisations, they're in different levels on that uh, maturity. So what I think uh, we're finding with the 12% is people have a desire to be more in the influencing piece, but they're stuck in the books and records. And that's why I think there's a big influx in terms of ERP. People hope that that's going to be the silver bullet that gets them out to do the books and records and allows them to have the time to do more of the influencing. <coughs> so I think as we go forward, that's where we as a finance function need to be. And I certainly, if I look at the people I'm trying to recruit, I'm looking for people who've got the ability to do the books and records, but also have the ability to step in and do the influencing, because I definitely think that's where finance will go in the future, and should go in the future. And Tim, <coughs> do you think that's possible to find that, find that kind of set of people? I'll be controversial, it all depends on how you set up your ERP. I think quite often people start off with a view of ERP as the silver bullet. I don't think they spend enough time trying to understand what good looks like for them in terms of an ERP system. So they actually implement stuff that they think is going to resolve their issues. In the reality, I think it's solving a problem they haven't got. So that's where I would spend the time focusing on. And when I go out to companies, when I go in, usually it's because the finance transformation is not working. And I go all the way back to step one and say, well, what is it you actually think you want out of it? Yeah. And the number of times you've got people scratching their head saying, I thought I wanted this. And then you start challenging them and they realise that they wanted actually something different. But they set the system up based on what they thought they wanted rather than what they actually yeah. need. Yeah. So, so Phil talked us through this whole concept that we at HFS are calling the digital dichotomy, <coughs> where there is this big slowdown driven by macroeconomic factors, you know, UBS getting acquired, SVB uh, uh, collapsing, layoffs happening, inflation not slowing down, supply chain getting issues, there's a bloody war going on, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but at the same time, the hunger to grow and innovate <coughs> hasn't been, you know, there is a big hurry. In fact, everybody wants to do it faster. So as a finance leader, how do you balance? How do you, how do you influence your organization? And, and Michael, maybe if I can start with you, right? Because uh, Adidas is in that space, right? You're yep. not, you're not you, you cannot escape from the macroeconomic headwinds that you're facing, but at the same time, you're into metaverse. You were just promoting your app on getting digital shoes and, and whatnot. How, how do you balance this as a finance leader? Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to link it to the previous question. Um, if the CFO has global business services as part of their remit, uh, it automatically means you become multifunctional, right? So you get supply chain, you get finance, you get HR services, you get procurement. All of these areas are then in <coughs> so you can start to build the connections. So if you, as a finance leader, want to have that influence, I think GBS is a really good element that you could bring into your organization to make it more multifunctional and to actually start to look at the end-to-end, -end, 
with S4, we are introducing S4 at the moment, we call it transform, with S4 as a facilitator of actually making that change and starting to talk about the end-to-end. -end. Um, so how do you you know, balance these two elements? I think everybody always has this cost drive and on the other side, you need to go faster and faster. So we're doing a, a couple of things that are fa fairly traditional. We're, we just brought 500 of our FTEs into our India hub that we're building together with a partner. Um, and we believe that that will bring us the talent and the capability that we need to actually be faster in our responses to the things that are happening in the outside world, but also with a lower cost base. Um, so we believe in looking at where can we find those capabilities, buying those capabilities, br bring that together, together with our partners, and then from there drive also the innovation. So um, our S4 program that we have, we have 700 people sitting in Google in India that we just built in the past two and a half years to actually to facilitate that for us. So you can reduce your cost, you can get the right talents because the talents are there, and then also deliver on your uh, in innovation roadmap. No, yeah, no, that's that's interesting. So you, uh, Tim, I, I wanted to get get your thoughts into into balancing this, right? You're, Tell us a little bit about Stellantis because, as you mentioned, you know it's one of the least known, most famous car company, <laughs> right? Uh, and and you're selling, trying to sell luxury cars, right? Uh, how do you how do you balance these things in your finance organization? Yeah, maybe just going back to the earlier slide about the, the, the four factors and can you do all at the same time? And I think, I mean, from my experience over the last few years, I mean, the, the priorities of the organization change depending on the on the context. So. If, Going back to the start of the pandemic, we sell quite a lot of cars to rental companies. Um, when the pandemic hit, no one was flying. Airport parking lots full of our cars that rental companies were getting no revenue for, and therefore they didn't have any cash to, to pay us. So, so our focus at that time really shifted onto maybe more of the the more mundane sort of stuff, like um, collecting receivables, which. You know, normally is a pretty straightforward back office function that the CFO would never get involved with. Um, and that then became, well, actually you've got a weekly or fortnightly meeting on the CFO reviewing line by line what your receivables are, which, you know, the year before the pandemic, that would never have happened because it was completely under control. So, yeah, I think things do change, whereas now, I guess, as we're in a constrained production environment, the focus is, is much more on um, <coughs> profitable growth and you know, maybe not selling cars or as many cars to low margin channels are trying to maximize the revenue of, of every vehicle. So, so that's, you know, that, that, that has changed, I think, as, uh, as the environment has changed. Um, and, and then a little bit about Stellantis. So, so the company is made up of three predecessor organizations, really. So um, it's because my, my involvement in it started in uh, 2017. So I came from the Opel Vauxhall side of the business, it used to be owned by General Motors, and GM sold its European operations to Group PSA in 2017. And PSA, the company behind Peugeot and, and Citroën. Um, and after that, that merger or that acquisition, um, the, the legacy GM business was on a journey really to adopt all of the the, the group PSA systems, uh, whether they were better or worse than the ones that we had previously. We, with one real exception, which was actually around our ERP, and we decided that we were going to go for uh, a single version of SAP S4, and, and we've been gradually implementing that um, since to our 2019, actually, was our, our first, um, when we went live with our first pilot. Um, <coughs> And we're on that journey, and hopefully, for the for the at least for the legacy PSA companies, we're we're quite a long way down that line. And then, of course, a couple of years ago, we merged with Fiat Chrysler to create um, the company Stellantis, and now we're thinking about how do we adopt um, all of the work we've done on, on this um, SAP S4 system and uh, bring the other group companies in, into that journey. Um, so when we still haven't finished the previous integration, so it's uh, ever-changing. <laughs> can, can I just chip in as well? I think one thing the pandemic has really highlighted is the need to be on top of the fundamentals. So I'm old 
And I always remember when I was doing my county exams, the, the big thing was cash is king. Mm. I think the last two or three years has really highlighted, as you were saying previously, yeah. it was probably below the radar, it was coming and it wasn't a problem. And again, myself, I found myself, and I'm sure you have as well, you're just concentrating on making sure the money comes in, because if the money comes in, you can pay the wages, pay the bills. Yeah. So. yeah, so, Carolina, I want to come to you. You know, we are facing a lot of macroeconomic headwinds, and this was a survey which was done two months back, and now it seems old, right? Because this survey didn't capture the SVB bank failure, this survey didn't capture the, the UBS things, uh, but before before I get into this, should we be worried? <laughs> because a any time a bank failure happens, you know the whole world is has got tremors on. Oh man, is it going to be another recession, or is it going to be? So what do you think? Well, I think even before the recent events, we all knew that we were heading to a pretty difficult economic environment, and that inflation, high, high inflation. I want to not say just the unemployment level, but actually the change in the employment patterns and where we're seeing that flow to skills and flow to um, employee interest versus employer needs, which I think it's at a big tangent at the moment. And I think it's at a very interesting point to see how that evolves. So we all knew that kind of that was coming. Um, you add on top of that now the pressure that these two recent events have added and sort of the rethink around regulators on particularly the U.S. regulator around uh, the different rules applied to the different tier banks, etc. So I think, obviously, perhaps one of the biggest concerns is what's going to happen in terms of regulation and more regulation, which is something that the financial industry has been... Grappling. Exactly, over the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> and that definitely requires a lot of investments and costs um, in a world where also that is under significant pressure. And that's the balancing act that we need to do. Um, I think there are many different uh, ways, and we'll see what happens over, I mean, the Fed announced today 25 bips, but we'll see how it evolves. I do think, though, that uh, the way that the industry, particularly the banking industry, has responded this time is very different and a lot more comprehensive. A, B, there's a lot more um, rigor on the fundamentals, uh, particularly for the systemic banks. Uh, therefore, I think the, the risk can be contained much more effectively than before, but that's not going to change the fundamentals of the macro environment that we're going through in terms of the actual impact to the everyday citizen on, on inflation and cost of living. So that's going to remain. Yeah, I, I would also say, <clears throat> should you be worried, now concerned, if you go back to 2008 when Lehman's went bust, that week or two afterwards, and I sat on a trading floor yeah. and watched some very, very senior traders look scared. The fact that um, uh, Credit Suisse went bust and HSBC uh, has just bought SVC uh, or the UK arm of it, and it's taking it in a stride, is, is promising. So it's a, it's a concern rather than a worry, because an, an event has happened and yet business is carrying on. And if you go back to 2008, when uh, Lehman's went bust, but Four or five weeks, it was touch and go when the whole thing would collapse. Yeah. So, Michael, do you sleep well at night these days? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, the way to address all of these changes that are happening, in my view, is create agility and empower your teams. So, in the end, it's about making sure that your teams have the capabilities to respond to this and really put it down low in your organization. Um, we have a process that we call objective key results. We copy that from some of the big tech companies. Um, and that's how we align within our teams about how do we prioritize when certain things happen. We review that every, every three months. We have three or four weekly sprints where we can review again. So we're constantly fine tuning what we're doing, what we're prioritizing. So if something in the outside world changes, we're able to respond to that fairly quickly in all of our businesses, right? So all of our departments. It's not just a tech thing, right? Which is, it is in many companies. It's also a thing that we believe we need to also ingrain into the rest of our businesses and the rest of our departments to make sure that we're constantly fine tuning across the different disciplines, f f supply chain, finance, HR, procurement. Okay, what are our priorities? Sales, what are our priorities? What are we going to work on? And how are we going to deal with this challenge? Now, some things you cannot avoid, right? So if China all of a sudden locks down and you have a certain percentage of your revenue there and you sell to retail stores, 
There's not a lot that you can do, right? You can be as agile as you want, but you just need to deal with it. Uh, but then you can respond in the sense, okay, what inventory am I still sending there? How am I going to deal with that? If you have somebody saying something on social media that used to be very much part of our, of our revenue, right? Um, that's a thing you need to deal with as well. And then you make the right decision. And I'm, I'm very proud of Adidas that we made that decision. But it's also a decision that's costing us almost, you know, one billion in sales. So it's, um, it's, it's also a lot of money that you then lose. But you deal with it and you need to then move on and have the agility within the team to adapt to that situation a, as soon as you can. Um, so for me, the answer is I sleep better because I feel we have an agile organization. We can do even more, right? So we're not there yet. Um, but that way we can respond to these changes fairly quickly. Uh, no, that's great. Uh, Tim, are you sleeping as well as Michael? Um, yeah, I think so, but mainly just out of tiredness from <laughs> all, all of the hassles of implementing our new IT systems. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think on, on this session, we, we probably uh, you know, pick out a few of the themes on this as well. I mean, certainly supply chain disruption has been a significant issue for us for, for a number of years. I mean, just going back to the to the pandemic and you know, we, we closed the factories, we stopped ordering microchips um, and then lots of other industries started ordering those microchips and sticking them in laptops and tablets and so on. Uh, we had some fires in, in some of the factories and we wanted to, to bring the production back up. Actually, the supply wasn't there um, and, and we're continuing to, to, to see the impact of that. And, and maybe the other thing that, that impacts us perhaps a little bit um, than your panel as a whole is is on the regulatory oversight front and um, particularly on, on emissions. Um, so the emissions landscape in, in Europe in particular is, is changing um, and there's, there's quite a big debate on, at the moment on future emission standards for combustion engine vehicles. So does it make sense to spend a lot of money to comply with new emission standards when actually you're going to be phasing out combustion engine vehicles in, in a few years' time. So you've got a relatively short life cycle to, to recover the cost of that investment. So, you know, th those are quite difficult decisions that we're having to toy with at the moment. Yep, yep, yep. No, uh, I, think, I think the one interesting thing is that these number of bars are increasing every day, <laughs> right? If I have to uh, create this question, write this question again, I can add five more. Uh, 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 and that's, that's, that itself is perhaps the biggest uh, challenge uh, is, is the number of things that are hitting us is, is just increasing and increasing every day. Uh, so I think, Michael, I, I'll just skip some of these, and I wanted to talk about global business services right? um, uh, a little bit. Um, and for those, you know, I, I, I'm assuming everybody knows GBS, what GBS is. If not, there is a definition on this slide in the italics. Um, but I wanted to ask the audience before we before I ask the panel, uh, is this concept of global business services, is it more important or less important compared to you know where we were pre-pandemic versus where we are today? Uh, it'll be great to have a have a debate uh, with you and what we see from the uh, from the audience. Uh, is it becoming more critical to have a GBS function or? You know, GBS doesn't really do much beyond cost. You know, what's the what's the general opinion here? Who all think GBS is more important than it was three years back? It's it's a hygiene. It's hygiene. Oh, so can I go for the contrary view, which is it should it's as important. It's as important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you, do you do you guys agree GBS is more important today? Yeah, I would say yes, because uh, um, uh, not because I'm in GBS, but when I, I what I just explained earlier on the on the cross-functional, I think if you want to create that agility, um, if you have an organization where you have a lot of your teams sitting in in Adidas, we're active in over 80 countries. So if those teams are in, sitting in 80 countries, and then let's say uh, we're going to introduce a new system, right? We're going to say to everybody, you're all going to use S4 now, right? I have to go into 80 countries two weeks to introduce a system, right? If I have it in three hubs, I can do it in six weeks. So my, my speed to market, to actually make the change and to make the introduction, 
to change the process, to tweak things, is significantly higher. Plus, I can do it more efficiently because I can create within my hubs delivery excellence, automation, process owners, have product-led teams, right? So product owner together with tech, sitting with the SME and the process expert, further improving the process and transforming it, um, and doing that across the board. So not just with one function, but actually having all the functions sitting there under one operational leader. Um, so yeah, my speed is significantly higher. And it's not finance transformation, because I saw the questions that you sent to us in advance and everything had finance in it. <laughs> For me, it would be enterprise transformation. It's much broader. It's not just focused on finance, because then we go into the silo again, which is what you know got us in some of these predicaments that we have today anyway. So I think we need to think more end to end, and that requires us to let go and really let go. And I, I like the comment earlier on trust, let go of this silo thinking of this is my department. I'm very glad to say that in Adidas, this is the first company, I've worked with four different companies where I worked on GPS, but it's the first company where I actually see this change readiness and this collaboration mindset where you can actually talk to sales and they're open to talk to you, right? They want to work with you and they want to further improve the way of working. Um, and I think that's what gets you the value out of GPS. So yeah, for sure it's more important and for sure it can still deliver a lot of value to, to any enterprise, I would say. I think I 100% think agree with everything that you're saying and I genuinely believe that that's the way forward. Um, particularly when you, we're trying to move to a sort of customer centricity approach, outcome versus activity, management and, and being driven by. Um, I think it's not possible unless GBS is fully embedded into the end-to-end -end activity, but also understands what role they have to play in terms of the final outcome, product, service, whatever it is that we are delivering, and how it's integrated through the whole chain. Um, the other thing that I've seen is a lot of um, entrepreneurship mindset in GBS, which was something different from before. I think before there was a lot more reactiveness to, to what the business asks as opposed to proactively um, proposing and, and finding different ser even services uh, that they could be offered, the company could be creating, etc. which I think it's a, it's a very interesting shift. I can definitely see that in, in the bank. And how the profile of the teams have elevated to truly form part of the decision making of the key considerations when we are even delivering or, or driving new products, new services, um, or even improving <laughs> the old ones, which we do quite a lot. Um, and so I think it's perhaps not the, f the, the activity itself is more important, it's the connectivity and the collaboration port that has gained a lot more relevance, and we now understand and see the value of it, of driving it. Yeah, yeah I, th I think at HFS we've, we've created these three horizons for finance transformation. I think horizon one was you know, just optimization of, you know, whether it's order to cash or procure to pay. And I think, I think if you've not done that, then, you know, you need to, uh, I think that's necessary for survival. Horizon two is similar to what both of you are saying is how do you connect finance with the rest of the organization and create these end to end flow, which is what we call the one office, right? It, it needs to be, you can't say finance is no longer a back office function. You know, it is not. Let, let's just be honest about it, right? And and you need to look at finance impacting customer experience. And if you start to look at it that way, then the way that you look at finance transformation is gonna be very different. And then I think the third wave uh, is the ecosystem, right? How do you connect, not just look at finance inwards, but also outwards, right? And how do you connect with the other partners, other technology providers, service providers, uh, et cetera? really drive that. So I think that's how we are looking at it, which sort of resonates with both, what both of you are, are saying. Which also leads me to my next question, if we can, if we can get there, <clears throat> is emerging technologies, right? Uh, a lot of emerging technologies are trying to create finance use cases, right? Whether it's automation, you know, when I, blockchain is actually distributed ledger, uh, you know, you look at every every technology, emerging technology that's being sold out there, the first business use case is generally around finance. But if you actually look at it, very few people have been able to scale these technologies in finance functions, right? Probably analytics, right? And, and I was trying to ask more a, more a question around advanced 
predictive analytics. I think we got more of a you know general analytics answer. But with the exception of analytics, everything else is very limited, right? In terms of scaled adoption. So I, I this is a two-part question. You know, what is the most sexy technology? What's the what's what excites you as 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 business leaders? And then why can't we scale it up? What's what's holding us back? Maybe maybe Tim, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we're really into sexy stuff, but um, <laughs> we're finance. <yeah. laughs> so, I mean, I mean, from my perspective, when we did implement a, an RPA CV um, five or six years ago, actually, and and then we had some you know, quite good initial successes on that, um, and. And why hasn't that, that scaled more? I, I think you know, there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, and, and one of them actually is just, well, they probably both relate to, to the, the historical context of the company with, with the two acquisitions that we've had. Actually, we, we end up with so many disparate systems and you automate a process in one system and then you, know, you have to keep repeating that robot across multiple different instances of SAP and that becomes quite, quite hard work. And, and then the other practical point is that you know, we have a limited number of people with a limited amount of time to focus on stuff. And, and actually, our priority really at the moment is, is trying to move everything onto as close to a single system as possible. Um, so actually, that, that is probably more the focus at the moment than, than maybe some of this, this other sexy stuff. And maybe in, in a couple of years, when we've, we've got our basic house in order, and you know, maybe that's the time to start looking at some of this. Yeah, Joe, what do you? So my vision of finance is that finance is a business enabler. So any one of those technologies that facilitate that, I'm into. The one I've delved in a lot recently is uh, data and analytics. And I used to work at HSBC uh, about four or five years ago. I was in a group called Data and Information. And they created, as you well know, the app. You know when you go to HSB and you've got the app where it shows you uh, how you spent your money and it tells you, helps you create vaults to save your um, uh, to save money. All of that was part of the group that was helping develop that, and that was brilliant because it helped uh, visualise what people were spending money on and help them <coughs> develop. So I love all of it, but I, I want the stuff that's here and now, ready, available, I can plug in and use it. Carolina? Um, I think um, the scalability point is an interesting one. I do agree that it goes to limited I mean, limited capacity, limited time. But I think um, it also kind of brings out another problem that I think we're facing today, which is active prioritization. And when you have too many balls juggling yeah. up in the air with so many risks, I mean, no wonder why it's difficult to prioritize because you have too many pressures coming at you at the same time. And you have your no negotiables, which is things that you can't really fail at. And then how does it that translate into creating extra capacity. Um, I think one of the ways to, to, to really move forward is uh, these two main concepts. One is seed funding and starting small. Um, I think in big complex organizations, it's sometimes difficult to move at pace. Um, Agile is a really good way of doing it implementing Agile as a mindset, not just the framework, but as a mindset takes time because it's about culture, it's about people trusting and collaborating, it's about forgetting that, okay, you're not my boss, but we're in this together or I'm delivering for you. It, it really, it, it's a big, big shift. Um, but this, this piece around starting small and almost identifying those, we could call them agents of change or people that have naturally develop this kind of growth mindset and ability to work in a much, in a very different way. That can be a good space to start, tackle relatively targeted problems and then think about how to scale up. And um, because otherwise too many of the problems that we have are too big to handle quickly and without a multi-year program. The reality is that data, uh, <laughs> cleanliness of data, availability of data, management of data. This is one of the key problems that all of the organizations are facing and finance as a key recipient and then creator and translation of that data suffers from every single day. But the problem is really massive. So unless you start to break it down and start with smaller, faster, 
seed funding approach that doesn't require you more than a few resources that you kind of bring fans and start like that, I don't think it's going to happen. And the second that I mentioned around prioritization is um, having to risk accept that there will be some things that are just simply not possible if you want to create that capacity. Um, and th yeah, and that's a bigger decision, right, in the bank wide, well, well in the industry, in the company wide, to define those priorities. Right, Michael. Yeah. So I would say I, I will, I get excited about all the technologies, actually. Uh, um, but what's the trick, in my view, is what do you take out of your back backpack, right, as a tool mm. to utilize for a problem, right? If you see a nail, uh, yeah. And the hammer, it's, uh, you know, if you use RPA everywhere, it's not going to get you anywhere, right? So you need to, to choose the right tool. I also believe that when you look at the prioritization that you just mentioned, yes, that's really important. But what we try to do too much, in my view, is we have, you know, VPs and SVPs prioritizing things, right? Well, they actually have not necessarily any clue what the real value is, yeah? And value is not make a business case, it's very simple. Apple, strawberry, right? Which one is bigger? Apple, strawberry. You know which one is bigger, right? So choose the apple, right? And you don't need a VP or SVP to make that decision. Let your product owner make that decision and decide what's adding the most value for the company. What we should do as leaders is say, what are the big pockets of value that we see identify that for our teams, and they'll make the right decisions to deliver against that. Don't micromanage, just let them make those decisions and strive for it. And maybe, maybe they will do something with these technologies that you didn't think of, and that actually brings you to the next level, right? Brings you the new, the new Google or the new chat GPT or whatever new technology. Let them go into the rabbit hole and identify different options. Does that cost money? Absolutely. Does it deliver? Not always. 90% of the cases it might not deliver. But if they do deliver, it might be something that you're really glad that you did make the investment, right? And it doesn't need to be, with these technologies, a lot of money. Yeah? You can do that also with small investments within the team. Yeah. So utilize the knowledge of the people that you have in the organization. And I really like what, what uh, Phil showed on the slide. 90% of the people, right, are open to make that change and to get empowered. Yeah. But we don't empower them. So what do they do after two, three years they leave? Yeah. No, so that's a, that's a, a, a really good, different conversation, if you don't mind me saying. What I mean by that is you're talking about a learning culture where you empower the people to learn and develop. I think one of the problems the senior people have is they don't distill that all the way through the organisation. So where people are in a good place to make those decisions, they don't feel like they can do. And that's maybe what was coming out in the survey yeah. a bit earlier yeah. on. Yeah, uh, no, and I think what we've seen is in, in, in finance GBS uh, organizations, every decision needs to have a spreadsheet behind it, which is based on a balanced scorecard. Even an apple versus strawberry will have 20 different columns of what are the different things and five, five different people rating those. And then the weighted average will be taken to get to the answer of apple is probably bigger with some degree of confidence. But there isn't the term fail fast or fail quicker? Uh, I mean, it's uh, that yeah. ethos. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I, I think we are pretty much out of time, but would love to get some audience questions in for, for our panel before we before we move on to the next session. Any Anybody <coughs> has any questions? As an analyst, I have 20 other questions, but you know, uh, that I can ask. Anybody? Oh, there's, there's one question. Now a question more common to, to this gentleman here on uh, sort of trying to move all the different uh, tool systems into one single ERP. So that actually ends up taking a lot of the use cases away is, is what we find. So RPA is destined to be, the, be that bridge between the, the different systems. So in an environment, for example, at Hilti, where majority of the tools are run on SAPs and then we purchase a lot of the productive add-ons, for example, Blackline, then what we do find is that that ends up eating into the, the RPA pipeline. So I was wondering if you're starting to come up against that and what are your thoughts on that? Tim, do you want to try and...? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've got a whole host of um, 
guess, subsystems which, which feed into the, the, the various different ERPs. So, um, yeah, I, might, I think I, I agree with that. It's one of, one of the things we did and we have used RPA for, actually, um, particularly after the, the PSA acquisition, was to get the data out of our, our legacy GM systems and reformat it into the language that um, our new owners would understand. Um, yeah, and very often it was a lot quicker to do that by using some RPA on the, on the user interface rather than um, spending a lot of time and money developing new reporting out of so yeah, some quite old legacy systems that um, were very costly to, to make those changes to. So, yeah, I agree. Yep. All right, I think that's all the time that... Oh, Carol, one last question. So, if you could just, every couple of minutes, you mentioned the project around data. Sorry. You just mentioned, the, from a finance perspective, the project around data that you had at HSBC. I'm just curious to see how did you set that up for success? Who, who led the initiative? Well, first of all, we do have, we moved away from having data strategies in the different businesses and functions and actually have a centralized chief data officer across the entire organization, but not just the chief data officer, the organizational structure that almost enforces that connectivity. Uh, because more often than not, you would discover that finance was doing something, which risk was doing the same, and actually was the same attribute that we were looking to remediate. Um, so this new um, kind of holistic approach um, and having the, the approach of one single strategy customized to the different needs, but also based on the same principles of data refineries, uh, controls, data lineage, etc. I think it's um, is, is the right one. Now, the second thing that, that we're doing is a little bit of the prioritization of what's more important, because obviously all of it is urgent, all of it is important, and prioritizing not every single use case against each other, because some items are not comparable, but what is for business generation? What is for, let's say, mandatory activities or different buckets of, of, of cases that will allow us to that decision faster in the different areas and, and therefore split the, the focus and, and the time of the teams in a much more effective way. Um, and I would say the third element is the upskilling. Um, I, I do think that data skills are in high demand and many of, of the, particularly the new joiners to the workforce don't want to work in a bank, they want to work in a much more cooler environment and attractive, techy new startup industry. Uh, so how do we do that and how do we position ourselves as a great place to work? Because it has so many interesting challenges that can be very exciting for people that are curious, that want to um, do really things that add value and that they can see the difference. Um, that's, for me, the other critical part. I'll just chip in as well. <clears throat> One of the things that you've seen an increase on is CDOs, Chief Data Officers, to drive that consistency. So it's moved on since I left the HSBC, but initially there were CDOs in all the businesses, and as you say, now they've been pulled in and global to drive the consistency. Yeah. Well, that's all the time that we have, but we have a lot more networking breaks. Uh, we have lunch coming up and we can all talk. So we can continue this dialogue, but thank you everyone for, for sharing your experience. Thank you.